this is a, uh, it's a big group and you're all spread out. And the good thing is that I like wandering around when I'm talking. So, uh, so a couple of things. Uh, uh, one is that uh, I have a cold. And so if I start sneezing uncontrollably, you'll know why. Uh, another thing is that um, if there's something that I start talking about and you don't understand, you have no clue what it is I'm talking about, then that means that there are other people who also don't understand. And the thing that I hate the most is to get the end of a talk and have somebody ask a question that means that I was totally unclear. So please feel free to raise your hand or yell out or do something you know, to indicate that you don't know uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to convey. So you've been reading, or you're in the middle of reading, and I guess we're not going to really point, maybe, because I can't point on two sides at once, and I'm not going to stand back here and point. Um, you've been reading Henry Lax, and today I'm really going to talk to you about some of the ethical issues associated and brought out by that book directly and indirectly relating to human research ethics. Uh, so here it is, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta went straight to the admissions desk and told the receptionist she was there for a treatment. Then she signed a form with the words operations permit. So this is uh, permission to be operated on. I hereby give consent. She printed her name in the black space, a witness with illegible handwriting signed below. So informed consent <coughs> to, have the to have the operation. So have you read this far in the book yet? Yes. Okay. Then she's unconscious on the operating table. Uh, but first, uh, though no one had told Henrietta that Talind was collecting samples or asked if she wanted to be a donor, Wharton picked up a sharp, sharp knife and shaved two dime-sized pieces of tissue from Henrietta's cervix, one from her tumor and one from the healthy cervical tissue nearby. He placed the samples in a glass dish. He wrote in her chart, the patient tolerated the procedure well and left the operating room in good condition. On a separate page, he wrote, Henrietta Lacks, biopsy of cervical tissue, tissue given to Dr. George Gay. So the, a lot of the discussion about um, Henrietta Lacks and the bioethics of, of this book or associated with this book have to do with this paragraph, this specific paragraph, because this is <clears throat> this is where things uh, were questionable. So where are we? We're in February 6th, 1951. <coughs> What's going on in the world of bioethics on February 6th, 1951? So four years earlier, just after World War II, in uh, August of 1947, the Nuremberg Nazi doctors' trials were carried out. And the Nazi doctors who committed uh, 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 ethical atrocities during the war were sentenced. And one of the things that came out of these trials was what, are, what was called the Nuremberg Code. And that code had some specific ideas associated with them. Some of them, uh, the, probably the most important, was that the individual comes first. And that idea, the individual comes first, has become the central feature of, uh, of bioethics. Sometimes it's called autonomy. We'll, we'll see it reappear uh, uh, again. The individual comes first. And that means that the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. So obviously, in our case, Henrietta Lacks you know, didn't give consent for what was done. The subject should be at liberty to bring the experiment to an end. It doesn't really refer to this case, but, but part of being willing to participate is the idea that, well, I've had enough. I don't want to participate anymore. And you should be able to stop. And the last, uh, uh, last major idea is that the risks of human research should never exceed the importance uh, of what's being done. These are ideas. Okay, this is hidden below uh, the uh, screen there uh, in red. Uh, what, it, what, this, what, the, what these ideas are don't tell you actually how to do. Uh, oh, you can see it over there. I, don't tell you how to do it exactly. It's, it's not regulatory. It's educational. It's aspirational. 
So the next shot at human research ethics really in the world came uh, in June of 1964. Uh, so this is 13 years after Henry Adelax. And at that point, um, the World uh, Declaration of Helsinki put forth another set of aspirational goals of how to do human research. And these were very similar, but an expanded version of the original uh, uh, and Nuremberg Code. So this is 1964 now, so this is 13 years after Henrietta Lacks. Two years after that, 1966, this paper appears in the New England Journal of Medicine, Ethics in Clinical Research. And it begins, human experimentation since World War II has created some difficult problems with the increasing employment of patients as experimental subjects when it must be apparent that they would not have been available if they had been truly aware of the uses that would be made of them. So this was a major criticism within the American medical community of what American physicians and researchers were doing. In response to this, nothing happened. So 1966, we still don't have any regulations. In the 60s, another series of events were going on. We were having human transplantation for the first time. The kidney, liver, lung. In December of 1967, uh, Louis Washkonsky had a heart transplant. He lived 18 days. So in the face of all of this transplantation medicine and everything else in genetics, <coughs> In 1968, uh, Vice President Walter Mondale, uh, 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 who was then a U.S. Senator, uh, former Vice President Walter Mondale, uh, calls for formation in the United States of a commission on health science and society. He says the transplantation of human organs has raised such serious public questions as who shall live and who shall die. Becoming techniques of genetic intervention and behavior control will bring profound moral, legal, ethical, and social questions for a society which one day will have the power to shape the bodies and minds of its citizens. Nothing happened. The uh, commission never was formed. Nothing happened until 1972. In 1972, the New York Times uh, front page reported about the Tuskegee study that had started uh, 40 years earlier in 1932, a U.S. Public Health Service experiment uh, in which a group of African American men uh, who had syphilis were allowed to continue to have syphilis so that the physicians involved could study the natural uh, uh, development uh, and ultimately death of those patients and are those subjects, I should say. And even when penicillin became available that could have been provided to them to cure their disease, uh, they were told that it wouldn't work for them and for a variety of reasons uh, they could not have. So they were deliberately misled. After Tuskegee, uh, there was, it was like things changed instantaneously. And in 1974, the US Congress appointed the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. So finally there was going to be something specific in the United States. Uh, and so this is now uh, quite a bit after Henrietta Lacks. So when Henrietta Lacks was treated, there were really no uh, specific regulations that were uh, guiding uh, how she was treated. Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, commission produced uh, a famous document known as the Belmont Report. In 1979, uh, it, it uh, established the ethical principles for carrying out uh, uh, research for the protection of human subjects. Uh, and there were three basic principles. The first was respect for persons, which required informed consent. The second was beneficence, which meant that you, one maximizes benefits uh, versus risks. And the third was justice, which means that uh, you re one should be recruiting and selecting subjects fairly 
so that uh, we shouldn't be using one group of subjects to develop a treatment, for instance, that will be benefiting mostly another group. And, uh, and, and part of this was to protect potential subjects who are vulnerable, and in that original uh, 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 journal, New England Journal of Medicine paper, some of the examples of groups that were being treated were people uh, who uh, were mentally incompetent, children, uh, soldiers, different kinds of groups of people who really uh, didn't have the ability to make a, a free uh, decision as to whether or not they wanted to be subjects. So, and then the other thing the Belmont Report did is it said, you can't, if you're working with human subjects, you can't just do what you want. It's not a situation where the investigator decides they want to do something, and then you carry out the research. In the middle, there's something now called the Institutional Review Board. That Institutional Review Board has to decide whether or not what the investigator wants to do is okay. And that Institutional Review Board has to be there everywhere. Here's your website. If you haven't seen it before, this is Eastfield College's Institutional Review Board page on your website. Uh, protecting human subjects through institutional review boards, and it explains uh, what it is that has to be done. <coughs> so, uh, so this then became the standard. Uh, and now we can go back uh, to uh, Henrietta. And uh, remember, she gives consent, uh, and, uh, and then they uh, shave this piece uh, of tissue. Well, the consent form now, most places that one uh, uh, gets an operation looks much more complicated. Uh, instead of being one thing, do you give consent? It's now six or seven. And, uh, and usually what happens is that you just sort of sign it. You don't pay necessarily much attention. You might not notice even number four, which says by your signature, you allow us to do what we want with your biological specimens. Um, those removed during your operation, uh, uh, unless you, you know, specifically want to uh, uh, set forth some regulations. So how frequently do we sign this without doing anything about that? Well, in August 1999, the uh, bioethics uh, uh, advisory uh, commission uh, uh, did a survey, and they discovered that at that time, this is 1999, there were 265 million pathology specimens in the United States representing 65% of the American population. How many people here have been in the hospital and had any kind of surgery? Every one of you who have, I'll bet, has pathological specimens in that hospital that you probably signed off for, not realizing that if somebody wants to do research with them, they could. So it's something that we all have done. Um, and there hasn't been, until very recently, uh, uh, a lot of attention paid to uh, how, uh, how we're going to manage these specimens. It's only because of genetics and the potential for genetic signatures to identify specific people that there has been much more of a discussion uh, about genetics. And uh, recently, uh, this is, um, I think last, uh, this is September of 2015, uh, the feds proposed a new rule for managing a lot of different things about uh, human research. If you look carefully at this website at the top, you can see a, a whole bunch of different uh, names, Homeland Security, Agriculture, National Aeronautics and Space, Defense Department, National Science Foundation, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we have, we're trying to have one, each of these organizations does human research. And the goal of this document, which was 131 pages, is, uh, uh, is to outline a specific common rule that everybody is going to share. And one of the things that this change, this revision says, is that uh, the re it requirement for written consent for an use of an individual's biological samples should become more specific, including the idea that option for consenting to future uses. 
So what that might mean is that you would consent now to study the pathology of my specimen to determine it's, whether or not I have disease. So let's say uh, to, to cut uh, microscopic, uh, to, to cut uh, sections and do a microscopic evaluation to see what my disease looked like or where the margins of my tumor were or something like that, but not to get permission to, let's say, do genetic studies. And the scientific community hates this idea because this would mean that if I wanted to use somebody's tissue to do genetic studies, I would have to go back and find them and get their permission. Otherwise, I couldn't do it. And this is not an established principle. This is uh, right now a, a major discussion going on on how to revise uh, uh, the human research ethics. So how about cells like Henrietta's? So um, this is current policy. And that has to do with when uh, things like cells are or are not uh, uh, part of human subject research. So when, what, what would not be considered human subjects research? And the answer is established cells from a donor whose identity cannot be readily ascertained. So if you don't know who the donor is, established cells from that donor can be used for research and it's not considered human research. This is called exemption number four. And the requirements are that the subjects cannot be identified directly or indirectly. So my, throughout my entire research career, uh, I have used human fibroblasts for my work. I have no idea who they came from. Uh, uh, but I, I, I was able to get this exemption to carry out the research. So even though it was a human research, it was under exemption number four. So now using this, we can go back and think about Henrietta. Ward wrote in her chart, the patient tolerated the procedure well and left the operating room in good condition. On a separate page, she wrote, Henrietta lacks biopsy of cervical tissue, tissue given to George Gay. If he had not written Henrietta lacks, everything he did would have been just fine by modern standards. Now it's true that, it's true that he didn't ask her if uh, he could use her sample or take those samples, but based upon what I told you, we could anticipate that she would have signed off just like all the rest of us have, even if that was somewhere in the informed consent. So the real problem, the real bioethical problem that emerges from HeLa cells is that we know what HeLa stands for. That's the real bioethical problem. And, and what is that problem? Why has that become a problem? And the problem, the problem emerges because when we start talking about genetics, we have, uh, have to understand a new relationship. In genetics research, one subject can equal many bodies. And what I mean by that is that in this uh, uh, series of interacted, in, interrelated people, the, the person who an aster has the asterisk, her twin next to her, has the same genetic composition. So if I learn in research about her, then if that, well, that's what I'm saying it wrong, but in any case, you get the idea that, that, that members of the same family uh, have a lot of information about them that's revealed by knowing any one member's uh, genetic composition. So in the case of Henrietta Lacks, that's what's happened. How to deal with this situation, which is called secondary subjects. So the genomic data uh, about individuals is relevant to the family and larger groups. And these genetically related individuals become secondary subjects. What to do about them is generally not uh, well established. But in the case of Henrietta Lacks, uh, uh, the decision was uh, by the community when a group um, decided that they wanted to publish the genome of Henry Letta Lacks, that they had to go to the family because there was a lot of information about her being re, uh, uh, that would be revealed about them by publishing her genome. And in the end, uh, they struck a deal uh, with NIH uh, uh, over the conditions under which the genome could be published and uh, how that the genome would be used would be subject to certain restrictions that were established by the family. 
So what about what about the the, uh, uh, the monetary value? Because HeLa cells have been used for all sorts of things, and people who've used HeLa cells have made lots and lots of money. So a lot of people feel, well, you know, that ought to be, you know, there should be the family should get some compensation from all this. Uh, and the answer to that is not true by reason of law. So when you think it's 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 interesting um, if you if you uh, think we have uh, law and ethics and they sometimes overlap, but not always. So we might think that it's ethically relevant or important for the person to get some compensation, you know, for their cells, but the law has decided otherwise. And this was a number of years ago in 1990 in a case that went to the California Supreme Court where a man uh, 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 had, uh, had uh, uh, I think it was hairy cell leukemia cells that had been taken uh, by the physicians as part of his uh, treatment and, and analysis and they eventually develop, uh, developed these cells into very profitable cell lines, made a lot of money for University of California and he said, Moore said, I want part of that money but the court found that Moore had no property rights to his discarded cells or profits made from them but he did have the right to be informed. He did have the right to be informed, and and and, and he could bring a claim for injury if he if he wanted to on the basis that he'd been injured because he wasn't informed. And now I can tell you that we have very extensive conflict of interest regulations. I looked, and you guys don't have a conflict of interest uh, uh, website on the. Uh, uh, you, I'm sure that. Those, re those uh, restrictions and regulations are buried in your IRB website. But you can't have conflicts of interest, um, uh, and if you do, they have to be disclosed uh, to the person who you want to be a subject in your test. So you have to say to them, well, you know, uh, we may get some very valuable information out of this uh, to help us start a new company or to develop a new project, and if we do, unfortunately, you won't be sharing in those problems. Okay, so let's get back. Let's get back to the subtext of this book, which I think is equally important. Uh, which is, uh, remembers Tuskegee <coughs> and these uh, syphilis victims in the U.S. Uh, who went untreated for 40 years. Um, this is the first paper in that sequence, published in 1936. So it's not that actually the, this study was unknown. And, and one of the reasons why this study has become so important is there are a lot of people um, who feel, who have written about the idea that, that the African American community has become very wary uh, or became wary of human research uh, after uh, discovering what had been done to that community uh, in this study. So who are these guys who are running this study? Uh, Von Delier and Clark as the, as the lead authors, uh, and, and they were both U.S. Public Health Service physicians at the time. And the, and the uh, Tuskegee study was started uh, with them they, under the direction of a man named Hugh Cumming, who was the U.S. Surgeon General. So the entire United States uh, medical establishment was complicit in carrying out uh, Tuskegee. These guys, Clark uh, and uh, Vondelier and Cummings, were all students of a man named Harvey Ernst Jordan. Uh, Jordan was a professor of anatomy and dean, of, uh, later dean of the University of Virginia. Uh, and, uh, and he was very interested in something called eugenics. Uh, he, gave a, he had a famous course uh, the Place of Eugenics, or paper called The Place of Eugenics in the Medical Curriculum. The ultimate ideal is for a perfect society constituted of perfect individuals, elimination of as much physical, mental, and moral sickness and weakness as can be, profited, as can be provided, and the future doctors are the ones who have to lead the way in eugenics. So what is eugenics? Uh, eugenics was an idea started by Charles Darwin's cousin, uh, Francis Galton, uh, back in the, in the 1860s. Uh, 
and the word eugenics just means good genes. That's what it means. And what, what the, Francis Galton said was, hey, look, we spent so much time breeding cattle and horses. Why don't we spend more time thinking about breeding people? So we should make sure that the best breed with the best. And that way, we're going to get fantastic qualities of racial, uh, physical, mental uh, excellence. Um, a few years after that, a man named Alfred uh, Plot uh, uh, in Germany um, thought about eugenics from the opposite point of view. He said, well, actually, the problem is not so much that we need to breed to get the best people. What we have to do is weed out the worst so, so that, so that uh, modern medicine keeps people alive who would never make it to breeding, would never have offspring, uh, if we didn't keep them alive. So, so what's happened is that uh, 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 we need racial hygiene, is what he called it, and that way will prevent breeding uh, of people who we don't want to breed, and that will improve uh, the future qualities. In the United States, we love this. The U.S. philanthropic community thought this was uh, fantastic. So in 1907, all of these famous foundations are supporting this. Russell Sage, Carnegie, Rockefeller. Uh, and, and basically, uh, the argument that they used was one that now, I think, most of us, at least intellectually, totally reject. Uh, uh, although lots of people still live uh, in, uh, uh, at, at some level, believe in this kind of stuff. What they think is that progressive application of science to eradicate social pathologies is, is what eugenics was all about. And we're going to get rid of crime and poverty and alcoholism and intellectual disability by getting rid of the defective genes responsible for these different conditions. And, and what nobody seems to imagine at the time is that it's the, in many cases, the issue is not the defective genes, it's the defective social conditions. So if we put our focus on the defective social conditions, we have uh, a much better chance uh, uh, of, uh, of, of eradicating these various conditions, these social pathologies. But that's not where these folks were. And a very famous place in the United States, in biology even today, Cold Spring Harbor Labs, uh, which is where uh, Watson the, uh, discovered, you know, worked for, for many, one of the discoverers of, the, of DNA, worked for many, many years. Um, housed the eugenics records office, and that office played a major role uh, in fostering the idea that the character of a nation is determined by its racial qualities and, uh, uh, and had a marked inf uh, uh, impact on. Um, uh, immigration policy, and now we're not just talking, you know, uh, obviously African Americans were included, but now we're talking about uh, uh, dysgenic Italians, Eastern, Eastern European Jews, lots of different groups that were perceived uh, at the time as having uh, uh, racial features that would not contribute to the United States. And, uh, and also proposed uh, that we have uh, what they called eugenical sterilization. So this was the idea that people who are not fit to be parents should be sterilized. And of course, 95% uh, 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 of the time this meant women, uh, not men. Um, and so uh, this idea ultimately uh, came to the uh, Supreme Court of the United States in the case of Buck versus Bell in 1927, uh, where Virginia wanted to sterilize Harry Buck and the Supreme Court said, well, you know what? Uh, it's OK. Uh, it is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their, time, their kind. This is our Supreme Court. And this decision has actually never been overruled, although obviously it's, it's certainly socially but the, overruled. But 60,000 Americans, mostly women, were sterilized between 1927 and the 1970s, and they were referred to as defectives. So, so this whole idea of eugenics uh, is as much a part of our culture and our need in uh, thinking about uh, dealing with uh, uh, the ethics 
of genetics and related things as, as ideas, as more typical ideas about uh, racism. And, uh, and uh, when the uh, uh, Human Genome Project was announced, or was first being studied back in 1988, uh, the Office of, Research, of Technology Assessment you know, made this comment that new technologies for identifying traits and altering genes make it possible for eugenic goals to be achieved through self-selecting technologies. That means parents <laughs> making decisions uh, as opposed to government uh, post social control, which is what had happened in the past. Okay, so uh, the, the, I'm, uh, we have some time for questions. My goal was to introduce you to some ideas about human research ethics, which I think are you know, fundamental to understand Henrietta Lacks. Uh, this whole idea of uh, uh, de-identified specimens and secondary subjects. To tell you, if you didn't know about it, about the Tuskegee experiments, which has had such a big impact on the African American community in terms of human research and the eugenics uh, movement, which is uh, uh, consistently a, a problem that is in the background we have to think about as well. And, and you mentioned the everyday practice of science. If there are two copies in the, uh, uh, your library or in the community college library. If uh, somebody's interested, this chapter five called Informed Consent and Risk, uh, you can learn more about uh, in more detail about what I've been talking about. So. Uh, we have time, I think, for questions. Is that right? Anyway, so until we get thrown out or somebody makes you leave, uh, any questions or comments? Yes. Yeah. No. Just stretching. Yes. So you said it was. After she, uh, the doctor put her name down, that it was not okay anymore. So, how does that, how does that help out for the family, for them, you know, being monitored? <coughs> so, the, so the question is, since the doctor didn't put her name down at the beginning, did put her name down, that created this problem, uh, and uh, so how's that going to, you know, now, uh, will the family somehow get compensation for that, or some kind of, you know, benefit? Um, and I think that the answer to that is that uh, uh, directly, the only compensation was being uh, brought into the decision of how the uh, genetic information about Henrietta Lacks could be published. Uh, indirectly, uh, I think that Rebecca Sklut, uh as part of her um, relationship with the family, uh, uh, has uh, tried to create a foundation uh, to support them and, uh, and, and things that, that, that the offspring of, of Henrietta Lacks uh, would like to engage in. So I think that, that but that's, a, that's not a government recognized, uh, that's, a, that's a, a kind of philanthropic activity that people feel responsible for what was done. The only government thing really was the, the, the and the sharing of the information about the HeLa cells uh, and, the, and the genome. Other questions? Yes? You mentioned about the exemption number four. Yeah. And uh, I'm just clinically speaking, you know, all the John Doe and Jane Doe that, you know, are deceased in the hospital and stuff. I mean, it's essentially a loophole that you guys, you know, researchers. Yeah, so the question is uh, about John, uh, exemption number four. Does that mean that any John Doe or Jane Doe in the hospital who dies and people get the uh, uh, material uh, from them, uh, can that be done? Can you do research on them because of uh, the lack of uh, uh, specific regulation that prevents that since they are de-identified? The answer is yes, you can. But is there more propensity? Oh, so is there more propensity for researchers to do that? Well, yeah, a lot of times people who die in the hospital as John or Jane does are people who died in um, accidents of some sort or another as people who were ill and in the hospital for treatment. And if you're ill and in the hospital for treatment, people know who you are. So because that's part of the process of going in. And most of the time, the tissues that we're interested in the most uh, are tissues that are going to come from people uh, who are sick to help us learn more about uh, those people. In my case, I was actually, I always was interested 
in, in studying uh, the healthy fibrotic response. So for me, any human fibroblast was just fun. <coughs> Other questions? They've got two on that side. Come on, guys. I mean, you know, you're falling behind. It's two to nothing. Yes? If you didn't sign the consent, for instance, you crossed it out, what assurance do you have that that would be followed? <clears throat> uh, if, if you, if when you do sign consent or you don't sign consent, what assurance do you have that it will be followed? Well, the, uh, the consent forms have to always be maintained. Uh, uh, and so unless somebody illegally destroys them, they're there if somebody wants to challenge whether or not the physicians involved had permission uh, to actually use uh, the materials in the way they used them. So that the, uh, in, the, in, in the state of Arizona a few years ago, a group of Indians in the Grand Canyon um, wanted to have uh, some genetic research done on uh, their uh, the diabetes they wanted to know if it was a specific type. It was a small tribe. And uh, Arizona State University took uh, samples from the members of the tribe, and they concluded that there was no linkage to this diabetes. But they decided they would do other things with those samples that was well, and they studied mental disease and tribal origins and a bunch of other stuff. And the tribe got very upset and sued uh, because they didn't have permission to do those kinds of things. And in the end, uh, the courts were uh, going to settle for the tribe, so you, uh, Arizona State settled and destroyed all of the samples, all of the notebooks, all of the work that was in progress. So that's one case where you know that where it, it became where people then you know could see that this could happen if it, if you do things that don't have consent. It may be that people do that. You know, uh, uh, and other people don't find out about it, but there, but it is, it is a regulatory requirement to have those samples and those those uh, consent documents. Uh, so one more question. Yes. How does the common person know they even challenge? Once our blood. Well, you know, for those of us who who like me who've given blood and samples in the past, they're just there. So we're just talking about the future. And, and, and now, you know, so if you go in the hospital, if you have to go in the hospital, you could always just say, is there a thing in here for doing consent about using my samples? And they say yes, and you say no. You tell them, forget it. I don't want you to use my samples for anything. So they can't. All right, we're losing, uh, we're, this is like, we're, uh, this is, uh, this stream is turning into a torrent. Any more questions? <coughs> yes? Are there any books that deal with the sterilization? Or, yeah, there's a, there's a, there are a couple of recent books in the last couple of years that have just gone back and looked at this whole area. And if you just go to uh, uh, Amazon and put in the word eugenics, uh, one of the best ones is called Eugenic Impulse by a guy named Nathan something or other. Okay. Who's at Vanderbilt. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Bye.